Was early man primitive or brilliant? Were they Neolithic Stone Age cavemen who used primitive tools? Or did they have knowledge from other sources? What is the evidence for ancient intelligence? Let's take a look and visit the past. First up are the great pyramids of Egypt, which are one of the most amazing enigmas of the past. The great pyramids of Egypt are truly a marvel of science. One of the fascinating mysteries concerning the pyramids is the never-ending debate among archaeologists as to who and how the pyramids were constructed. No one is sure. There have been all sorts of conjectures as to how these ancient wonders of the world were constructed. The educational and scientific communities have taught that they were built by droves of slaves who were illiterate, yet they were able to accomplish this massive task by using primitive tools, ramps, chisels, and hammers. However, what is certain is that the people who built these structures did so with advanced knowledge about how to construct them, with the knowledge of precision, laying a foundation, cutting and laying blocks, as well as lifting and setting them with precise alignment to the sun, moon, and stars. The stones are even accurately aligned with points of a compass. Yet the experts claim they do not understand how the pyramids could have been built without using laser technology because of their accuracy. There is only two hundredths of an inch spacing between the 100-ton stones. How could the ancients have constructed such impressive structures? Without having an understanding of modern geology, it is inconceivable that a structure this size could have been built that would not crumble, sag, or lean from lack of a proper foundation. Under such massive weight, structures normally sink slowly into the ground. Today, engineers find that modern buildings settle at an average rate of 6 inches per 100 years. We all know about the Leaning Tower of Pisa and the sinking city of Venice in Italy. On the other side of the world, Mexico City's historic Cathedral Guadalupe has sunk so much that it is now condemned. Even the United States Capitol Building has sunk five inches in the last 200 years. Yet in the last 5,000 years, the Great Pyramid, which weighs approximately 6 million tons, has settled less than one half an inch. The blocks on each side of the pyramid are the same level, and they are equally level all the way to the top. Evidently, the ancients had knowledge of the stability of the surrounding terrain and the necessary understanding for preparing a foundation that surpasses the expertise of modern-day engineers. Other terrain near the Great Pyramid could not have supported the immense weight of the structure. Megalithic Block Moving Time the traditional view of the construction of the Great Pyramid is said to have taken 20 plus years. With two and a quarter million blocks, this means each stone would have had to be cut, transported, and put into place in less than a minute. In addition, there are giant blocks that weigh 50 and 70 tons, which are located inside of the pyramid in the king's chamber. Placing them into position would be no small achievement. Once the pyramid was constructed, there was another issue concerning illuminating the various interior passageways. Oil lamps would not have been successful because of a lack of ventilation. Reflecting light with the use of mirrors would not have worked either because of a loss of light that is due to the refraction around each turn. How many sides? Recently, a pilot flew over the pyramid and discovered that the Great Pyramid of Giza has eight sides instead of four. The eight sides can only be clearly seen from the air on the dawn and sunset of the spring and autumn equinox when the sun casts shadows on the slightly concave sides. Where did the ancient Egyptians obtain this knowledge? The Egyptians left us some 3,000 years of written materials and pictorial history, which covers virtually everything that happened in their culture, 
from birth of babies, plowing, harvesting, building, weaving, sacrificing, praying, and embalming. But there is nothing recorded about the construction of the pyramids. Located closely to the pyramids is the largest monolithic structure in the world. The Sphinx is over 60 feet in height and 240 feet in length. It is carved from a single piece of limestone, and no one has a clue as to who created it or for what purpose it was carved. The Temple of Karnak In the southern part of Egypt, in the city of Luxor, is a temple that defies explanation. The columns are indescribable. The most impressive attribute of the temple is the carved hieroglyphics on the obelisk. The symbols are incredibly meticulous, being engraved on granite as if they'd been done by a machine. There are curved slots that are 0.1 inches wide and half an inch deep. The bottoms of the cuts appear to have been made by a rotating tool. The tools that the ancient Egyptians supposedly used could never have carved these impressions. It is said that the human hand, no matter how skilled, is not capable of making engravings with such precision. The impressions reveal 21st century technology. The Colossi of Memnon Across from the Temple of Karnak on the other side of the Nile River are two massive monolithic statues. Colossi of Memnon, each carved from a single block of stone and weighing an estimated 1,000 tons. The statues were quarried near modern-day Cairo and transported 420 miles over land without using the Nile, as they were too heavy to transport on the Nile at the time. Valley of the Kings A short distance away from the Colossi of Memnon statues are the tombs of the pharaohs, which are located in the Valley of the Kings. Over 100 pyramids have been found that were built by 40 pharaohs throughout Egypt, yet not one pharaoh has been found in a pyramid. The tombs are lavishly decorated and amassed with royal treasures, all for the glory of the pharaohs, who were considered gods at that time. Abu Simbel Temples Further south are two massive rock temples. One is dedicated to Queen Nefertiti, and the other to King Ramses II. The inner chamber of the temples is again without its equal. The pharaohs amassed incredible wealth, apparently in hopes of taking it with them in the afterlife. The glory of ancient Egypt is truly one of incredible knowledge, technology, and skill. Where did these ancient Egyptians receive their understanding and expertise in erecting these magnificent monuments? Accordingly, the timeline of history has previously just left the Stone Age and entered into the Age of Intelligence or the Bronze Age, which is said to be around 3000 BC. A Mystifying Marvel One of the most fascinating discoveries that baffle modern man's intelligence is an unfinished obelisk in the Aswan Quarry that is located 500 miles south of Cairo. It measures 137 feet, the height of a 10-story building, and weighs in at 1,200 tons. What was the plan to move the megalithic stone? The project was abandoned before it was completed, not because it was too massive, but because the stone had a flaw that surfaced. They apparently wanted one without any structural defect. The sheer size of the object is what makes it remarkable. It would have been a third larger than any other ancient obelisk known to us. There are very few modern cranes that could move such a massive object. So how exactly did the ancient Egyptians plan on transporting and erecting it? Stone Age Descendants Testimony Consider the following remarkable achievements in building the pyramids. Do these architectural exploits suggest a primitive society whose ancestors previously lived in a Stone Age culture? 1. Each side of the base of the Great Pyramid 
is perfectly squared with 90 degree angles. 2. The angles of the slopes of the sides are precise. 3. The pyramid's cornerstones have balls and sockets built into them. 4. The outside surface stones are cut within one one hundredth of an inch of being perfectly straight and at nearly perfect right angles on all six sides. They were placed together with an intentional gap between them of two one hundredths of an inch. 5. The longitude and latitude lines that the Great Pyramid lies on are 31 degrees north by 31 degrees west. 6. If the perimeter of the pyramid is divided by two times the height, the result is exactly equivalent to the number of pi, that is, 3.14. 7. On the first day of the summer solstice, the sun sets exactly centered between the Great Pyramid and its neighboring pyramid. 8. The weight of the Great Pyramid is staggering. It has been estimated to weigh 6.5 million tons. Giants enter into the equation. One possibility for the construction of these megalithic structures that has been overlooked and has not been considered by the evolutionary community is giants. Hieroglyphics are common throughout the ancient Egyptian culture and depict the life and times of the ancient Egyptians of the past. These engraved inscriptions portray the ancient Egyptians as being both small and great in size. There are even engravings of individuals who are hauling blocks of stone on their shoulders. If the blocks of stone resemble anything that is close to the size of the stones on the pyramids, then the individuals carrying them were giants. Of course, the conventional interpretation of such depictions is that these larger-than-life-size individuals are simply representations of the pharaohs and gods of the land. However, there is a clear and obvious indication that these huge individuals may actually be giants. Obviously, the contemporary pyramidologists have no place for such an idea. Besides the massive pyramids and other megalithic monuments in Egypt, there are mammoth memorials found on the continents and islands around the world which are astounding. Every single continent has megalithic stone monuments with blocks that weigh more than 125 tons. Thousands of these megalithic structures and stones have been placed all around the world, and many still stand even though they are said to have been constructed over 5,000 years ago during what is called the Neolithic Age or the Stone Age. Let's take a look at some of these sites, and we will see that the idea of primitive people being the architects and creators of these projects is erroneous. On the opposite side of the world from Egypt, in the continent of South America, there are several mind-boggling archaeological ruins that are astonishing. The pyramids of Egypt and the surrounding monuments are all crude compared to the workmanship that is found in the ruins of Puma Punca, Bolivia, which is located nearly 13,000 feet in elevation in the Andes Mountains. Bolivia, Puma Punca. The ruins of Puma Punca display megalithic granite blocks, which are among the largest found on the planet. They reach over 25 feet in length and weigh over 100 tons. Yet there is something amazing about the blocks. They are precision cut, smoothly polished, held together with metal clamps in sockets, and artistically decorated. 
the fashioning accuracy can be compared with that of our modern-day technology. The intricate stonework, precision, and exactness caused the 21st century mind to ponder. How did these primitive people accomplish such a task? For example, there are tiny penetrations that are evenly spaced in straight-line grooves that are just millimeters in width and are perfectly cut, a feat which cannot be done with Stone Age chisels. The lines cut into these rocks are precisely the same depth and exactly the same distance apart. The stone is granite or diorite, both just about as hard as a diamond. Tools would have had to be tipped with diamonds for cutting such precise incisions. These were master builders with technological understanding. Furthermore, these blocks had to be moved and stacked in their final resting places. Some of the stones weigh hundreds of tons. Archaeologists claim that the stones were mined over 60 miles away. The elevation is 12,000 feet. There are no trees above that level for rolling the stones on logs. So, from where did the knowledge come? Even more amazing are the H-blocks. Each block was carved from a single stone. There are no chisel marks on the blocks. Everything is so precise, so perfect. The technological achievement is that they are made to interlock one with the other much like the present-day dovetail work that is accomplished in assembling wood drawers. The blocks were so precisely cut that they perfectly interlocked with one another like the pieces of an elaborate puzzle. Were these engineers primitive Indians? Again, what reasonable answer can modern science give as to where these people received the knowledge and skills to construct such amazing works of intelligent design? How was the intricate work done on each stone? Mainstream archaeology says that simple Indians did the work. The quality of the stonework and the immense size of the blocks is so incredible and perfect that it appears as if they used modern-day machinery. This just proves that mainstream archaeology hasn't the foggiest notion as to how the work was accomplished or where the knowledge needed for the achievement originated. Peru, Sacsayhuaman. One of the most impressive megalithic monuments in the Americas is the Inca Fortress of Sacsayhuaman, which is located above Cuzco, Peru. It astounds all who see it with its distinctive construction, which utilizes scores of gigantic 10 to 300 ton boulders that are perfectly fitted together with irregular joints. The question of how it was done has amazed researchers and tourists alike for centuries. It is said to have been constructed by the ancient Inca Indians. Most everyone has heard about the ruins of the ancient city of Machu Picchu, which is also said to be of Inca origins and is located high in the Andes at 8,000 feet. It is a tough place to get to. Although the ruins have incredible architecture, it doesn't compare to Sacsayhuaman, which is at 12,000 feet and an even tougher place to reach. It is a megalithic monument that is built out of huge stone blocks and is 1,500 feet long and 54 feet wide. It is said that it takes about 10 men to move a one-ton block. The largest stone is 28 feet high. Talk about precision. One block is cut to fit perfectly with 12 other blocks. All the blocks are fitted together so precisely that a thickness gauge could not be inserted between them. They appear to have been molded together like putty, yet there is no mortar used in the construction. A short distance away, is another structure that defies conventional archaeology. This structure is located at the ancient Inca complex of Ollanta Tambo. There are six red granite megalithic blocks that are so precisely fit together that a human hair cannot fit in between them. Think about it. 
a pre-Inca fortress composed of rock walls of highly fitted blocks that weigh between 50 and 100 tons that were removed from a quarry that was located across a valley seven miles away, lowered down the mountain, moved over a river canyon, and then moved up a 1,000-foot sheer face of a cliff on the opposite side of the mountain. Most of the blocks consist of hard diorite, which has been said has the consistency and hardness of a diamond. All of this was at an altitude of around 12,000 feet. Archaeologists the world over insist that the megaliths of Machu Picchu, Oliantaytambo, and Sacsayhuaman are the product of many hands, which used primitive tools over many years. However, it is absurd to suggest that primitive people, who only had fiber ropes and stone tools to use, could somehow cut some of the hardest stones on earth and build giant structures with a level of precision that could hardly be matched today, and all at extreme altitudes. There has to be another more reasonable explanation. Peru, Nascalines, Another enigma in South America is the mysterious Nascalines in the Peruvian desert to the south. The Nascalines are massive carvings or drawings on the landscape of the desert that are scattered over nearly a 200-mile area. The lines were made by removing the iron oxide-coated pebbles on the surface, which lie on top of a white layer of hardened limestone. The longest line extends nearly nine miles and is perfectly straight. There are depictions of animals, birds, fish, and insects. There are over 70 creatures. The largest creature is the size of nearly three football fields in length. There are over 800 straight lines and over 150 geometrical shapes. All of these shapes make no sense nor can they be seen at ground level. It is only from the air that they can be seen and understood. Why? And who created them? Central America, Mexico. Moving northward, we find more amazing discoveries. Most people know that Central America is covered with ancient pyramid ruins of the Aztecs and Mayans. Over 1,000 have been located. The Pyramid of the Sun, which is located north of Mexico City, is in the ancient ruins of Tietohuacan is a well-known tourist site, but not so well-known as the stone orbs of Costa Rica that are strewn across the land. Known as Las Bolas Grandes, the giant balls, the total count is well over 1,000 in number, with some of them weighing more than 16 tons and being over 10 feet in diameter. One has to wonder why and for what reason they were made. Scientists from Harvard University have studied the stones and marveled at their near-perfect, spherical shape, regardless of their size. One of the largest balls has a diameter of six and a half feet, and its circumference has only two-tenths of one percent error in being a perfect sphere. Europe. Bosnia. Yet Central America is not the only place these stone orbs are found. More recently, more than 40 stone balls have been discovered in Bosnia, across the ocean in Europe. The existence of the balls in this region was not known until an earthquake in the early 2000s revealed them. They vary in size, with the largest measuring over five and a half feet. The balls have been buried, and only an accidental discovery is what has brought them to light. Russia. Champ Island. 
In addition, dozens more stone balls have been found on Champ Island in Russia, which is located in the Arctic Ocean. They are perfectly round and dot the landscape where they are found. Who carved them is still a mystery. Europe is dotted with prehistory 5,000-plus-year-old megalithic stone structures that are perplexing and baffling to the conventional archaeologist. These massive stone structures consist of some of the most famous and visually spectacular archaeological discoveries in the world and signify extensive technical ingenuity and organization that are essential to their construction. For example, Iceland, Scotland, Wales, Sweden, Holland, Germany, Spain, Greece, Portugal, and Malta all have megalithic stone monuments, burial chambers, dolmens, and other standing megalithic multi-ton rocks. England's well-known Stonehenge is constructed of 40 to 50 ton megaliths with pins and sockets to hold the crossbars in place. The megalithic stones were transported some 150 miles from Salisbury, Wales. Megaliths take many forms. They are distinguished by massive stone monoliths, which are their main structural components. Pyramids and obelisks are the most common and easily recognized. The other common megalith types include dolmens, menhirs, and tumuli. Dolmens are rock vaults, which usually contain one or more rooms that are thought to be used as burial chambers or temples. Tumuli are similar to dolmen and are tombs, which are covered with earth and stones to form mounds. Menhirs are large standing stones, or groups of standing stones, that are arranged in circles. Statues and other large single standing stones are often monoliths. Each site has a legend of its origins, but archaeologists differ between themselves as to how such structures were constructed, or even why they were constructed. Pacific Megaliths In the Pacific are stone megalith structures. For example, on the island of Tonga, there is a stone structure with 35-ton blocks. In Micronesia, on the island of Palakir, there is a seven-mile man-made island of basalt logs that were created on top of the coral reefs. It is called Nan Medol. Each basalt log column weighs between 5 and 50 tons. The columns of basalt are up to 25 feet high and 17 feet thick. The weight of the entire project is estimated at 750,000 metric tons. Moving 2,000 tons a year would require three centuries for the islands of Nan Medol to have been created. Why in the world would and how could islanders accomplish such a task? Over 10,000 miles away is Easter Island, which is one of the most remote inhabited islands on Earth. It is known for one of the most famous mysteries. Easter Island possesses nearly 1,000 large stone statues called Moai. The largest ever erected statue in antiquity weighs in at over 80 tons. On its head is an 11 and a half ton hat. The statue once stood at a height of nearly 38 feet, 10 meters. Archaeologists have debated for decades the methods that the ancient islanders might have used to extract, transport, up to 12 miles, 20 kilometers across the island, and erect them. Archaeologists do not know why the statues were created, how they were transported and erected, and why many of them were abandoned and unfinished. Yet there is still an unanswered challenge. El Gigante, the giant. This unfinished massive statue is still in the quarry and would stand over 70 feet in height, a six-story building, and weigh over 270 tons. This is equivalent to almost exactly what a giant Boeing 777 airliner would weigh, fully loaded and fueled for takeoff. It would have been the largest statue ever erected, 
How the giant was meant to be moved and erected by using simple methods is still a mystery to conventional archaeology. The legend of the islanders insists that the statues walked upright from the quarry to their final destination, aided by a mysterious supernatural force they called mana. Exactly what part did this magical power play in the actual transport? Could it be something related to the supernatural power of the fallen angels? Asia Megaliths We find megalithic structures throughout Asia. India and Indonesia have megalithic stone structures. Japan has an ancient burial chamber that is made with 60 to 70 ton stones. In the country of Laos, thousands of megalithic stone jugs are laying openly in the fields. The local legend says the drinking vessels were for giants who used to inhabit the area. They are up to 10 feet in height and weigh up to several tons each. Korea has the highest concentration of dolmens, burial chambers, in the world, with over 30,000 megaliths that weigh 30,000 pounds. Middle East megaliths. Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Ethiopia, and Senegal all have megalithic stones that were supposedly erected by the ancients 5,000 years ago. Recently, in 1994, stone circles were discovered in Turkey that were supposedly constructed in 10,000 BC. This was located in southeastern Turkey, in Sanlurabav, when a shepherd boy spotted the tip of the stone sticking out of the ground. He dug and unearthed a 19-foot pillar whose edges were precisely cut and had a relief carving of a strange animal on it. The pillar was fashioned by talented stonemasons who worked with advanced tools. Since 1994, only 5% of the area has been uncovered. Circles upon circles of stone monoliths, 19-foot columns high, weighing 15 tons each, claiming to be thousands of years older than Stonehenge of England and the Great Pyramid of Egypt. There have been no agriculture implements found in the site or stone-cutting tools. The place is 350 miles from Mount Ararat. The site was buried under 20 feet of sand until discovered. Lebanon is another place that grabs the attention of archaeologists. The little-known ruins at Baalbek, Lebanon, are among the most astounding artifacts of the ancient Roman world. The site possesses an enormous megalithic extravaganza of 10 and 20 ton blocks of stone that are stacked like ordinary bricks. In addition, there are six gigantic columns that weigh 230 tons each, and they are all that remains of the Temple of Jupiter Baal which is the largest ever erected by the Romans. Adjacent to it is the Temple of Bacchus, which is about the size of the Parthenon in Greece. Its remains are the best-preserved Roman temple in the world. It is well known for the genius of the Roman engineers. However, there is something more fascinating in the ruins of Baalbek. Underneath the temple are foundational megaliths, which have been given the name Trithalon, the Trithalon is a trio of 900-ton stones that form a part of the temple's platform. Below them lies a huge enclosure of 24 blocks, which weigh 400 tons each and seem totally unrelated to the Roman project. These megaliths are among the largest ever assembled. 
and there is reason to believe that they are not to be credited to the Romans, but are the work of a previous unknown earlier culture. Amazingly, there is another unfinished megalith, the famed Stone of the South, that is still waiting for transport from the nearby quarry. It weighs in at 1,200 tons and has been thought to be the largest cut stone in the world. That is, until recent excavations disclosed a previously buried 1,500-ton neighbor. The question proposed to us is who might have done all this incredible work, why, and when? The question that has yet to be answered is how were some of these mega rocks moved from their place of origins and placed precisely on top of each other? Even with modern-day machinery, it would take several dozen heavy-duty cranes to lift and transport many of these massive rocks. It would take at least a couple of dozen men just to move a one-ton rock. So then, what would it take to actually lift and move a 350-ton rock. Let's see. There is a 340-ton boulder perched above a long walk-through trench at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. The installation, called Levitated Mass, is a new work of art that is now open to the public. It is said, as one walks down the enormous boulder, one feels a sense of the huge monolith that's kind of levitated magic. The New Age movement is captivated by these megaliths. The real magic was moving the monolith some 60 miles from the rock quarry. The transportation vehicles measured some 300 feet long, which is the length of a football field, and it had 22 axles and about 200 tires. The vehicle clugged along at about 5 miles an hour at night with a crew of 12 and a police escort. It was far more difficult than expected because of the physics that was required, not to mention the 11-day journey and a cost of $10 million. What were the primitive ancients thinking? Were they unusually strong or clever? Did they receive outside help from another world? The public has been led to believe that primitive people who used primitive tools, somehow were able to carve, cut, move, and lift these massive stones into place. However, is it possible that ancient civilizations had some kind of supernatural or extraterrestrial help? Another question that comes to mind is why did the ancients build pyramids at ancient sites all over the earth for a period of time, and not just in Egypt, but then suddenly abandon them? What caused the ancient boulders to vacate the structures? Could it be that once Satan captures the hearts of individuals, he then seeks to destroy them through suicide, human sacrifice, or other destructive methods? Many of these temples were places where human sacrifices were offered to their gods, the demons of Satan. As scripture declares, those who practice such evil customs and rituals will be vomited out by the land. Leviticus chapter 18 verse 25 What the experts say Many megalithic monuments are said to have been built by individuals of the Neolithic Age, Stone Age, when farmers, some 6,000 years ago, were learning how to grow crops, herd cattle, and make pots to cook in. In other words, primitive conditions existed. Why Stone Age farmers constructed megalithic structures baffles modern archaeologists. Some of the suggested reasons for erecting these megalithic monuments were for keeping track of the calendar, paying respect for the dead, religious ceremonies, celebrations, and for artistic enhancement of their dwellings. Nevertheless, the secular experts say the cultures that constructed these megaliths possessed neither tools, saws, hammers, chisels, measuring tools, or finishing tools, nor the skills to build them. They say the massive construction 
and the materials used are impractical. The construction sites are seemingly without logic. And the construction methods which were required, it is believed, were unknown to those cultures. Are the experts suggesting magic? Could it be that giants were involved with these ancient civilizations? And could it be that they may have had contact with supernatural beings, such as fallen angels? who provided them with the knowledge and power they would need to construct such megalithic structures? To recap the observations and construction skills during that time, we know that many of the world's megaliths are constructed with blocks that have been carved and shaped to perfectly fit into random patterns. Sometimes the blocks had to be ferried across rivers to reach their destination. The structures have not shifted a millimeter over thousands of years of their existence. It is said that written language had not yet been invented at the time of the construction of many of these ancient megalithic monuments. However, it is claimed that the ancient unskilled labor force, without the use of tools, did this consistently over the entire globe. A Missing Ingredient of Progression one of the most perplexing aspects of ancient construction to the modern intellectual scholar is the absence of progression in the process of construction development from the beginning of time. There is no evidence that there was a development of knowledge over time from the Neanderthal mentality to an advanced level of construction methods. What was the state of progress and sequence of events from the simple gathering and assembling of rudimentary structures to the more complex and advanced construction? Centuries later, many of these megalithic structures were dismantled for use in inferior building projects. It is always easier to dismantle something than it is to construct it. Why did widely scattered and diverse cultures all over the planet have a strikingly similar obsession with using gigantic building blocks in their original construction projects? When one sees identical twins, one realizes that they have the same mother and father. The same is true in construction. The similarities between the temples constructed in both Cambodia and Asia and Guatemala in Central America tell us they originated from the same source. The same is true with the step pyramids in Egypt, Mexico, and Indonesia. The stonework in the megalithic walls of the Incas and the Egyptians are identical. The source knowledge has to be one and the same. And the most important question is also the most perplexing. Why does the construction evidence overwhelmingly point to a higher level of intelligence? In short, were these megalithic structures constructed by the giants we read about in the legends of mythology? And did these giants and ancient humans receive assistance and knowledge from supernatural beings? Ancient Wonder in Israel Israel's Stonehenge One of the great but barely known wonders of the ancient world is a Stonehenge-like monument that sits at the top of Israel's Golan Heights called Gilgal Rephaim, the circle of the Rephaim giants in Hebrew, and also called the Stonehenge of the Levant. The ancient megalithic monument consists of five concentric stone rings whose diameter is more than 500 feet and consists of more than 40,000 stones, totaling some 37,500 metric tons. Some of the stones that were used to create the rings weigh 20 tons, 
which is equal to 10 cars of average size. The outermost wall is about 8 feet high, and at its center is a heap of earth about 15 feet tall, placed over what is believed to have been an ancient tomb. The monument is located some 10 miles east of the Sea of Galilee, in the middle of a large plateau. The site is dated by archaeologists to be from around 3000 to 2700 BC. No one can see the shape of the monument from ground level, and there are no hills nearby to gaze upon it. The monument can only be appreciated from above. An aerial perspective is necessary to see the complete layout. It is said that the stone circles on the Golan Heights predate the pyramids and the Babylonian temples, which makes them the oldest astronomical complex in the Middle East. The question is, why would anyone have undertaken such a massive building project? It was most likely built as a cultic or burial site. However, one fact stands out. It is claimed that the local nomadic tribes of the time did not build any other remotely similar monument in the region. Circular building was not a fashion of the era among the herdsmen, and that, combined with their unsuitable primitive technology, seems to rule out their construction of the circles. As mentioned, it has been suggested that one function of the circles may have been used as an astronomical observatory and stellar calendar. It has been discovered through computer simulation that in 3000 BC, the first rays of the summer solstice would have appeared directly through the northeast opening. Such astronomical observations were essential for planting and harvesting grain. At the same time, the southeast opening provided a direct view of Sirius as it rose above the horizon, which is the brightest star in the night sky. Interestingly, the Canaanites had a connection with Sirius. The Sidonians called Mount Hermon Syrian. Sidon, or Zidon, is an ancient city located on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, about halfway between Beirut and Tyre. It was founded after the flood as a Canaanite city named after Noah's great-grandson, Sidon. Ham was the father of Canaan. Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and the territory of the Canaanites. Cult towers and a host of other complexes were constructed shortly after the flood by the ancients to worship the stars, sun, and planets. They are scattered around the world. Why were the ancients interested in building structures connected with observing the movement of the sun and heavenly bodies? Why were giants propagating the land that was promised to Abraham and his descendants? It is becoming clear that after the flood, Satan was determined to keep the prophetic promise of God, the coming Messiah, from being fulfilled. Who constructed the circles of the Rephaim? If the local inhabitants didn't construct the rings, then who did? What is really fascinating is that apart from the Bible, the stone circles are the source of legends about a remnant of the giants, or Rephaim, who had a giant king named Og. There is good evidence that the biblical giants, or Rephaim, were the architects and engineers who constructed the monument. As we have previously familiarized ourselves with giants in the Bible, and the various terms used, now consider the following biblical clues for the source of the giant stone circles. 1. In Genesis, chapter 14, verse 5, we are told the Rephaim inhabited the place called Ashtaroth Karnaim, which is just 10 miles from the rings and is the site of the ancient Canaanite city called Ashtaroth. This city is named after the Canaanite goddess of fertility, love, and war, who was the daughter of the god El and the goddess Esherah. 
2. In Joshua chapter 12, verse 4, we learn that King Og of Basham, the last of the Rephaim who lived at Ashtaroth, ruled a territory that stretched from Mount Hermon in the north. 3. In Deuteronomy 3, we are given the description of the size of King Og's bed, which measured nearly 14 feet long and 6 feet wide. 4. In Chronicles 20, the last of the Anakim was killed. These giants were descendants of the giants of Gath and were killed by David and his soldiers. 5. The respected Jerusalem biblical author Rabbi Yisrael Herzog, who is hardly an advocate of ancient alien theories, confirms the possibility that giant, heavenly beings or their descendants may have constructed the circles. 6. The Jewish oral tradition says, Og, the king of Bashan, descended from the Nephilim, who were deities who fell from the heavens. Sound familiar? Is Rabbi Herzog speaking of fallen angels? 7. Jewish tradition also states that Og had children, who were hybrid giants called the Anakim or Rephaim. Could they have built the giant stone circles at Gilgal Rephaim? Bottom line, it seems apparent that giants were involved in the construction of the stone circles, known as the Circles of Rephaim Giants. Dim-witted barbarians? It appears that the ancient builders were masters in their technical knowledge and skills. On the other hand, children's fairy tales such as Jack the Giant Killer have formed our modern perception of giants as stupid and violent monsters, sometimes said to eat humans. The ogre in Jack and the Beanstalk is often described as a giant who was not very bright. However, a number of giants may have been intelligent and assisted in the construction of the incredible structures of the ancients. The Zuzims, who were of a tribe of giants, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 20 through 23, were known as the achievers, or accomplishers and performers. They may be the source of the construction of some of the megalithic structures that are found around the world. We find the Zuzims listed in Genesis chapter 14, verses 5, 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 18, and Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10. Furthermore, one Arabic manuscript states that the city of Baalbek, which we covered previously in this chapter, was built by giants, and the city was named in honor of Baal, the god of the Moabites and worshippers of the sun. Looking at the megalithic structures that are presently in Lebanon, it is easy to imagine they could have been built by giants. Before the Flood One theory that describes the Earth's atmosphere before the flood of Noah's day hypothesizes there was a dense canopy of water that surrounded the Earth. Genesis chapter 1 verses 6 through 9. This canopy would have obstructed a direct view of the visible sun as seen today. And with the collapse of the canopy, cultic towers were constructed all around the world for the worship of the sun god. Actually, the Hebrew word for sun is first mentioned in the Bible after the flood. Genesis chapter 15, verse 12. No doubt the sun at the time which immediately followed the flood, would have been visible to the naked eye, like it is presently seen today. Likewise, Scripture reveals that no one can look at God and live. And after the flood, the sun would have been considered to be a God in the heavens that no one could or should gaze upon. Therefore, people quickly learned that one could not stare directly at the sun or blindness would result. It makes sense why these ancient structures were being constructed around the world after the flood. These temples were dedicated to the sun god. The worship of the sun led to the construction of these temple towers found around the world. The sun became the most powerful deity in the heavens, 
Many ancient cultures believed this god rode in his chariot of fire around the earth each day. Helios was the sun god of the Titans, Satan's covert mission. If we ponder the purpose of God to plant the nation of Israel in the land God called my land, Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 5, it would seem perfectly reasonable, even probable, that Satan's counter plan would have been to have his giants propagate the land of Israel in order to prevent the Jewish people from possessing the land. It would seem that Satan planted giants in the land in the hopes of infiltrating and occupying the nation in order to maintain control of his abducted earth. Satan's plan was to contaminate any offspring of the Jewish people through whom the Messiah, the Savior and Redeemer of the world, would come. Satan implemented his plan to contaminate Abraham's seed when he learned that his seed would one day be crushed by the seed of the woman, Christ, which was to come through Abraham. Satan's plan was to occupy Canaan with his own seed in advance of Abraham's seed. So when Abraham entered Canaan, we read in Genesis 12, 6, the Canaanite was then, that is to say already, in the land. Also in Genesis, we see other attempts by Satan to interfere with Abraham's seed before the birth of Isaac, as told in both Genesis 12, 10 through 20, and Genesis 20, 1 through 18.